I'm Erica Munro, I'm the Exhibitions Manager at Bletchley Park. And I'm Andrew Fryer and I'm the Outreach Learning Officer at Bletchley Park. We're here in Bletchley Park's historic mansion in the library and Andrew's got something to show us. I do, I have a box here and this box is actually an Enigma machine. This in the box. This in the box is an Enigma machine, yes. Very few of them left. When you say very few, 10, 20? Um, maybe 350. Wow. Yes. But very few of them are in good working order. Like this And one. complete. Yes. Like so. Can we take a look? We can. Shall I open the box? Okay, there we are. Okay. What is an Enigma machine, first of all? It's a polyalphabetic cipher machine. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it substitutes one letter for another letter, so you can encrypt a message. Right, so you type your message in this, and does it come out somewhere? Or is it like a typewriter, or Well, how does it le work? let me show you. It's electromechanical, mm -hmm. so I turn it on because it has a power supply. It has an internal power supply, or you can run it from the vehicle that it's being carried on. Right. And then I can press a key, and when I do that, one of the lights lights up. Mm -hmm. And if I press that key again, a different light lights up. So you've got your message on a bit of paper and you know you've got this letter and you press the, the key and you've got a light that lights up and that tells you your encrypted letter. Yes, that's absolutely right. Right on. So it's a different light each time. Is there is there well, an order? Can you tell what letter's going to light up? Well, that was something for the the crypto analysts to work out here at Bletchley Park. Uh, what happens, of course, is that when I press the key, not only does the light come on, but the rotor moves around. Mm -hmm. So every time I press the key, this first rotor moves. Right. And as it moves, what it's doing is changing the substitution. So a letter coming in will come into the rotor and will come out the other end of the rotor as a different letter. I say. So the person using this, they'd simply use this machine to get a different set of letters that they'd then send to whoever they were sending their message to. Yes. And the clever thing about it is there's so many ways to set up the machine that it's very hard to break that code. Do you know how many different ways there are? I do. 103 sextillion ways wow. to set up this machine. And of course we're not seeing part, all of the machine because there is a part here that was added later when the German army took over the production of this machine, and that's the plug board at the front. So you've got rotors here, you've got plug board here, and the person that sets it up can, can change how that's set up in different yeah. ways to make it encrypt differently. Yes, so every month a setting sheet was sent round to all the Enigma operators, or the commandants, and um, the Enigma operator would look on the setting sheet and see the day's settings. And then 12 o'clock midnight Berlin time, all those settings would change to the next setting on the sheet. Right. Okay. So you had to have that sheet to know how you set up your machine. Yes. And the person I guess you're sending the message to also has to know, have exactly the same settings. They do, yes. So if I open up the machine, mm -hmm. I'll show you what the operator would have to do. So here we can see the rotors. And I can actually move these rotors. And this spindle comes out, the rotors can all be taken off the spindle, and this particular machine, which would have been manufactured from 1938 onwards, came with five rotors. So it has three slots mm -hmm. for the rotors, but actually there would be a box with another two rotors, there's just one here, so I can show you. And these rotors are then fitted into the machine in the correct order. Each rotor has a Roman numeral on it, and that designates one, two, three, four, or five. Right. So you have these to pick five rotors. three of the five rotors yes. to go for, yes. right. And you can put them in any order? Or? No, no, the order's prescribed as well. Okay. So on the setting sheet would be um, columns, uh, and the first column would be the rotors in the correct order. Right. Okay, so before you even want to send your message, you have to set up your machine. You've got to get your rotors in the right order, pick the right rotors, put them in the right order. So if this has been 
set up now and you've put in your your rotors what do you do next well around the ring of each rotor are a series of numbers or letters on some these are numbers on this one and I have a clip on the rotor which I can undo and if I undo this clip I can actually turn these this ring around why would you and do that, that well because that then changes the relationship between the wiring inside the rotor and the letter or number so it makes it even more complicated yeah so that's right. the second column on the setting sheet mm -hmm. is the ring setting so each of these rotors would have a number and that would be the where you'd have to place the um, the number on the rotor I say did they do this at the beginning of every single message that they sent to change the ring settings and change the way the rotors were No, going? this was the daily setting. Right. So the daily setting would be the rotors and which order they're in, then the ring setting, but then the plug board pairings. Right. So the next part of the setting up would be to take one of the 10 cables and place it into one of the 26 sockets on the front. What does that do when you've plugged it in? Well, that substitutes one letter for another, but it's fixed. So that once that's set up, that's the same for the whole of that day. Right. And you say substitutes one letter for another. So if you didn't have a cable, you push your button, your light comes on saying that P becomes E, but your cable then changes E to another yes. letter again. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, so when you press the key, the rotor will turn, mm -hmm. then the current will flow through the plug board, through the first rotor, through the second rotor, through the third rotor, into a, ref a reflector at the end, which is a fixed rotor, mm -hmm. uh, where the substitution takes place as well, with fixed wiring. And then it reflects it back into this rotor, into the second rotor, into the first rotor, then back through the plug board, and then lights up the lamp. Wow, goodness. So can you show us, now that we know that how we set it up, can you show us again Press us a button and light us up a letter and just see how that rotor turns round. Because it's uh, just that one rotor yes, that's turning. You'll, yes, you'll see that when, when I close this up, you'll see that this is able to turn. You say that it goes through one rotor, through the next rotor and through the next rotor, but I only saw one of those rotors turning when uh, you were pressing the button. Yes. So what happens... Sorry. So what happens when I press the key is this first rotor will turn. Mm -hmm. And this rotor will turn every time I press a key. Right. Now, when I've set up the ring setting on here by moving the ring, undoing the clip and moving the ring, what happens is that a notch also moves. And that notch is connected to one of these letters. Right. And that notch dictates whether the rotor moves or not. So when this is in position, in the turnover position, then the next rotor along is able to move because there's three levers underneath here. When you press the key, the three levers try and push the rotors round. Mm. And three levers are actually in between the rotors. Right. And there's nothing to stop the lever engaging. So it turns every this, time you on press this, it. On this rotor, yes. Yeah. So right. this rotor turns every time. Right. But the ring stops this rotor. From, the, from engaging and only when the lever is able to push into the notch of this rotor mm -hmm. will this rotor then turn round. How often does that happen then? Is that Well that, that'll happen at some point during the, the 26 ah. rotations of this okay. or 26 positions for one rotation of this rotor. This will turn round when this one reaches its rotor position, its mm -hmm. turnover position but then it will turn around 26 times after that, 26 key presses after that. Right. And once this is turned, it'll turn again 26 rotations of this one, and this one will turn after 26 more rotations of that one. Right. So when people say it's a bit like, say, the mileage reading on your car as the right hand wheel goes round, and then you'll see the next one go round, and then. Yes, but it isn't. Because because of this turnover position, because it's you can select it. Right. So it's not always going to turn it's, on it's nine. It's not. It's not. Well, once it's in there, it'll turn twenty six times after that. Mm -hmm. But the the fact is, it'll turn at a particular point for each of these two rotors. Okay. 
And when you're and, and what what that means yeah. is that if this rotor is in its turnover position, this one moves all the time. Mm -hmm. This one's in its turnover position, then all three rotors will move at the same time. Oh, right. So it's not just a question of one or the other. Mm -hmm. it, it has this feature called double stepping, which means that if this rotor is turned into its turnover position, it will then step twice in a row. Right. So it's not like a car odometer. I see, I see. That's really interesting because I think that a lot of people who, who haven't heard the explanation that you've just given kind of think that that's standard how it works it's just one then the next and the next but there is there's a system there's a reason why yeah. inside as part of the design but of course the problem is if you can know the wiring for each rotor mm. which the allies did know then you can work out which rotor is in position by when the sequence turns in other words when the rotor turns over that's going to give you a clue to which rotor is in which position right because because you, once you know the rotor, you know the turnover position of that rotor is fixed with that rotor. Right. And that gives you the settings for the message, but also indicates the settings for the whole day's messages once you've been able yes. to get that. Yes. Wow. So the plug board at the front, which was added later, by the Wehrmacht, who, or the German High Command, who realised that they needed a better way of encrypting messages. It wasn't quite secure enough for their purposes. So they added this 26-hole plug board and eventually came to use 10 cables. Why 10? Why 10? Why not 11 or 3? Or... Well, 11 would actually give you a, a better result in terms of security, but for some reason they stopped at 10. So we have on the, on the setting sheet that's sent round once a month, there is a column which shows the plug board pairings. So it will have perhaps A, B might be the first pairing, in which case the operator would take a cable mm -hmm. and plug it into A at one end and then plug the other end into B. That would mean that it's a reciprocal connection. So the current would flow from A to B on the way through and then on the way back would flow from B to A. Right. Now in terms of how many ways there are to do that, you'll be amazed to realise that how many ways there are to plug 10 cables into 26 To change sockets. one alphabetic letter to another? Yeah. No, are you right? I can't calculate it. How many is there? Well approximately 150 trillion ways to do that. Turn one letter into another? by plugging in 10 cables. Wow, goodness. And that alone, just doing that, makes this so much more complicated than if the plug board wasn't there. Yes, in fact, at the very beginning, the, um, the spy who took photos of the Enigma machine from the factory, uh, when that was passed to the French and then to the British, the British didn't know what the plug board was. Yeah. Had the British ever seen an Enigma machine before? Well, the, there did exist some commercial Enigmas. So the Enigma machine was actually designed in 1918 and actually manufactured from 1923 onwards. So they didn't come as a surprise to them, this was, this was a known quantity? No, the Government Code and Cipher School had bought two Enigma machines oh, okay. before the war. So what was different between their Enigma machines and these ones? Because it didn't have the plug board on. Right. And so it was, only, it was only when the High Command closed down the factory mm. and then took it over and opened it to manufacture their version with the plug board on it. Right. So the military version that yes. the Germans developed was basically uncrackable, even though they had these two Enigma machines from the earliest days of the war. Yes. It right. made it much harder right. to break, even though the Polish had broken a version of it. Wow. So you've put your rotors in, three of them, from the five that you've got, and you've closed the lid, and you've put your cables in as well, that you've told us about. What, what would the operator do then in order to send the message? Is that, is that set up now? It's set up for the day, but for each message, the operator had to think of a three-letter password. Right, and that's just off the top of their head? Yes, So, and those three letters would 
be the three letters that would appear in these windows here. And if some of these machines have numbers instead of letters, rather like this one, then there is a, a, a way of translating on, on here. So if the operator's not sure how to count from 1 to 26, then there's a little reference sheet. And that's different between every message that's sent and new password is put in right at the start. Well, that was the protocol. Right. But okay, the operators but... didn't follow the protocol. Okay. Because they had to think of a password very quickly and they had to think of it for every single message that they sent. And it had to be different. And of course, the fact they didn't helped the code breakers to break in. So would they just leave the rotors as they were and then start the next message? Or... There was some of that, and or they would use things like German swear words mm -hmm. or their girlfriend's name. Right, things that could be easily guessed. Yes. I, you, did, I guess that helped Bletchley Park. It did. As a way into to solving that particular riddle of that particular message. Yes. And also, if someone's using the same password, and you know, you know that that operators operating that machine. Oh, so you can identify individuals you can identify, through yes. their, their bad use of the machine or their bad habits. Yes. So if you have any comments about Enigma, any questions you want to ask, please put them in the comments box. Thanks Andrew, that was brilliant and there's so much more I imagine that we could find out. There is. If you've enjoyed it, do like us, please subscribe and uh, if you've got any questions like Andrew says, pop them in and check out the descriptions box for other links that you can follow to find out a lot more about Enigma and Bletchley Park.